Looking at sensory processes, as we've started to do in this lecture, we need to take some time to look at the actual organs themselves, the sensory organs that take in the data. So in this part of the lecture, we're going to march through vision and hearing and touch, look at how these organs operate, and then try to tie that back to how our brains make sense of the data that we take in. Let's start with vision. Vision is very interesting if you want to take a look at not just human vision, but the whole range of vision in the world. Um, dogs, for example, do not see actually very well, but they make up for that with a very keen sense of smell, smelling better, in fact, than, way better, in fact, than humans do. Um, so if we were to try to understand dog's vision, essentially yellows and blues and not exactly very detailed. Um, if we were to say, extend that to uh, animals with compound eyes, like some insects, um, or take a look at animals with eyes on either side of their heads, that is, they don't have binocular uh, vision like the same way we do, we could talk about seeing the world in different ways other than just the human way. The eye's most important part in terms of vision and sending data to the brain is the retina, which is on the very back of the eye. The retina is a light sensitive area uh, which uh, creates an upside down image on the back of the eye and then transmits the image data via the optic nerve to the brain. This um, area near the optic nerve actually is a blind spot. There are no vision receptors right around here. And because of that, um, you can actually trick um, yourself by utilizing the movement of the eye until you no longer see an object uh, once it gets into the blind spot. Because of the way all of this works, um, the physics of it is quite fascinating when you try to look at the level of the cells themselves that take a look at um, that take a look at the world, transmit that data to the world, uh, from the world to the brain. Um, and so we're going to take a look sort of at the photochemistry of that on the next slide. So you can see here the blind spot that I've referenced. Um, right outside of that is the area of the sharpest vision, the fovea. Um, where if you want to really pay attention to something, you kind of stare directly at it. Um, and then out from that, um, the retina continues to take in data via two kinds of cells, rods and cones. Rods are for viewing dim light. So it is what enables humans to see, um, not necessarily in the dark, but where there's minimal light sources. No color um, is available in rod data. Cones are for bright light and color. And it might be helpful to remember that on a test to think cones are color. Cones are color. Right around the optic nerve um, near the blind spot is the area of the sharpest vision. So uh, that is where you will see things the clearest. Because the optic nerve itself has none of these receptors, there is the blind spot right there, um, just where the optic nerve meets. How does all of this work? We've got the uh, picture here of the cones and the rods that kind of sort of look like little worms. Um, they take in light data and there is a photochemical reaction 
that happens with the light because light has different wavelengths um, and each color of light has a different wavelength. So let's take a look at that. It turns out that cones fire at different rates based on the light that strikes them, the wavelength of light that strikes them. So when cones fire um, in this configuration of heavy blue, a little bit green, very little red, um, that is experienced as blue because blue dominates. When cones fire with heavy green, green is experienced and then red combinations of these three, blue, green, and red, produce the other colors. Very little blue, but equal amounts of green and red means experiencing yellow. Orange, green, red, and little blue. Blue, very little green, very little uh, more red is purple. And all of them firing is white, since white is the combination of all the colors. This was uh, the origins of the idea of a trichromatic theory of color vision. There must be three kinds of receptors that respond to different wavelengths of light, and that means that color comes from three kinds of cone responses. Trichromatic, tri meaning three, chroma meaning color. One way to understand this is to look at the phenomenon of color blindness, which tends to be more uh, effective or more uh, an effect in males. And so red green color blindness is one of the most common forms of that, where folks who look at these particular um, configurations of dots of color have a hard time distinguishing any difference if you can read the numbers in um, these two pictures here, then you're in the clear. If you can't, then that would indicate that you have some difficulty with color vision. So this is a seven and a four, and that's an eight. Color blindness then helps prove the trichromatic theory. If you can't see green or red, you must be deficient in the cones uh, response rates for those uh, two colors. Um, as I did say, it's a sex, it's a most prevalent in males. Um, that implies that it's a sex linked condition. So it is linked to um, the chromosomal contribution that only occurs in men, i.e. the Y chromosome. Another theory of color vision known as opponent process. And the idea behind this theory is that there are opposing pairs of colors and those opposing pairs produce our color vision. So it's not just three different response rates, red, green, blue, but it's in fact pairs of response rates, red, green, blue, yellow, and black, white. This has been suggested by the experience of something known as an after image. If you stare at an image long enough, you will fatigue the sensors in the eye, that is sensory adaptation, and because you fatigue them, when you look away, you will see an after image, but in the opposite sets of colors. So for example, if we were to stare at this flag here, at the dot in the center with black, green, and yellow in it, long enough, say 30 seconds or more, and then look away after 30 seconds to a blank white space, you should actually see a negative after image of the flag in red, white, and blue. And in fact, I just did. So apparently opponent process must work. So which is it? Is it trichromatic or opponent process? 
it's both. So apparently the cones in the eye do behave in both ways. And we do experience color as response rates to different wavelengths of light, but also as pairs. Let's talk about the chemical senses and the mechanical senses. Light strikes the eye and produces a chemical reaction in the back of the eye with the rods and the cones through chemicals known as opsins. And in the rest of the senses, chemicals do also kind of play a role, um, but not via light, via things like scent and taste. Now you're probably, um, as I'm saying this introduction, kind of wondering what the heck this thing is, this weird little figurine is on the side. This is a sensory homunculus which is an illustration of how much brain space is devoted to sense data from different parts of the body. You can see a large part of the brain's processing space is devoted to hand data. The hand produces a lot of data. Tongue, lips produce a lot of data. Eyes produce, ears produce. The rest of the body, not so much. You don't get as much sensory data from your shoulders and therefore the brain doesn't give as much um, space to that, as much uh, processing power to that. So let's say goodbye to this little strange homunculus. And let's talk about the skin. In the skin, there are receptors that process touch, pressure, and temperature so we can feel when someone's touching us pressure how much pressure they're applying and the uh, temperature uh, that we experience the muscles in the skin give us position and movement data so we experience ourselves in the world this is known as proprioception so our bodies in space give us sort of like data about how we are interacting in that space. And in the brain, the somatosensory cortex processes these signals to help us navigate the touch experience of our world. So we know how we are interacting with the world around us. We can touch it, we can experience and feel it. things that often happens to us is of course interacting with the world we have pain and work on pain over the last few years has shown us quite a bit of information about how the brain processes pain we now understand that pain is processed into different locations depending on if it's real pain or perceived pain so one of the theories that um, has been proposed is that pain is controlled by a gate in the spine. And that gate is opened by certain chemicals. I'm not going to talk about what those chemicals are, um, but those chemicals open the gate, the signal travels through, and the brain um, processes that data. So we experience uh, pain when the gate is open and if you want to close the gate you can actually manipulate that experience by rubbing the painful area so let's say you bump your elbow rubbing it will send another set of signals to the brain so you've got the pain signals going there but you've also got your rubbing signals because you're touching the skin which are going to get um, more data in the brain and change the perception of that pain. So rubbing an injury does help to a certain extent. If you sawed your arm off, no amount of rubbing is going to help in that situation. You need to get to the ER. In the brain, we actually release chemicals called endorphins. And those endorphins act like morphine in response to the pain. 
endorphin means endogenous morphine. So we produce a chemical that's kind of like morphine. And that helps modulate our experience of pain as well. Some people experience pain in parts of their bodies that no longer exist. If you have an amputation, you've lost a leg or an arm or a body part in war, it is still possible to perceive pain in that missing arm or missing leg. That implies pain is not just physical through a gait in the spine, but also mental. We can have pain that has no physical relationship to the body. And this phenomenon of phantom limb proves that. We think that what happens is the loss of the limb causes the wiring of neurons to attach themselves to other locations. So it's as if those neurons are like, I'm lost, I don't know, my, my, my data is not coming from this thing that I used to connect to, but I'm gonna attach over here instead. And that attachment still produces the idea that the limb is there. So people with phantom limb experience itches and pains in limbs that don't exist. And that means clearly that we can experience pain that's not real in the body, that's purely an artifact of our brains. How do you treat this? Virtual reality therapy, which is shown here. This person has an amputated limb, but the virtual reality therapy is allowing them to interact with a fake virtual limb. And if your virtual limb itches, you can scratch it. And it turns out doing so causes the brain to respond. And you can deal with the experience of pain or an itch in a phantom limb. And eventually it does help. Smell is one of our oldest senses. Um, in many animals, smell is a very powerful and very useful sense, um, even more so in vision, say for example, dogs. Smell is also unique in that it doesn't go to the thalamus. Um, the five senses um, we've talked about so far Four of them go to the thalamus or the brain sensory postmaster for processing, but smell does not. Smell goes to its own special little tiny organ located just on the bottom side of the brain right about here um, called the olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb processes that data very close to the areas where uh, we process emotional information as well as memories, making smell very powerful when linked to memory as well as emotion. That's why smells can often trigger incredible behavioral responses from people. When we have aromatherapy it actually has been shown to help modulate the experiences of anxiety as well as pain for people. But sometimes smells can also trigger pain. If a scent is associated with a painful experience, you might remember that experience and it might actually make you feel those um, painful feelings again. So it turns out smell can be very, very, very um, invoking of deep behavioral responses to us um, depending on the emotional, you know, power associated with that smell. The question we often get is what about pheromones? Because animals uh, rely on pheromones. Ants, for example, lay down pheromone tracks in order to know exactly where to go. Hey, I look, I found food, so I've laid down this trail, and that's why ants seem to follow predictable orderly trails. Do humans do this? Um, it turns out that we have the organ to detect pheromones in utero,
but during the process of gestation, um, the the you know unborn um, developing human decides uh, as part of well it doesn't really decide but um, as part of the evolutionary genetic process um, that vomeronasal organ withers away it atrophies that doesn't mean though that babies um, are sort of like born without the ability to smell in fact they do have very strong smelling capabilities and not very good vision in fact um, no color vision um, and in fact, we do know that babies prefer the scents of their own mothers. Probably makes sense. Um, you know, you want to nurse from mom who's going to, you know, provide you with nutrients and take care of you. Adults then do not have this ability, do not have this organ. But there's still some research to show that humans have preferences for certain kinds of pheromones that are associated especially with sexual behavior, menstrual cycles, and sex. So there must be some kind of communication going on. Turns out women um, have better um, smell abilities than men, and research has shown that women who smell garments worn by men can detect which garments um, indicate that man is most compatible with her own body chemistry. The way this research is done is they have men wear um, t-shirts without showering for several days, bag the t-shirts, and then women sniff them to determine which scent seems to be most um, appealing to them, which scent they prefer. And when we do the biology behind that, we find that that woman's biochemistry and that man's biochemistry um, tend to be more of a match. So what can we say about the ability of humans to communicate through smell? It's not a whole lot um, in terms of our abilities because we don't have that organ. At the same time, there are some levels of communication, particularly associated with reproduction. What about taste? Taste is another chemical sensory uh, process. Chemicals dissolve on the tongue, producing the sensation of taste. Five tastes, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, umami, umami. Umami is one of the more recent additions to our list. Umami is for savory. It's proteins like chicken or mushrooms. Um, it's sort of like the yum, 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 um, we're getting protein kind of taste. So um, why these five tastes? Sweet. Sweet is essential for survival because our brains live on glucose. Sugar is important. Sour might indicate some kind of danger, so we have to be careful around that. Salty, we need salt to live. Uh, we can't survive without it. Bitter probably indicates poison or something we want to avoid. Umami, protein, yum, builds muscles. These receptors are all over the tongue. Um, and they tend to be more um, powerful in children, more of them in children, which is why children are often pickier eaters because they taste more strongly than adults. And so if you've got a child uh, who seems to say, ew, I don't like the flavor of that, it's probably they experience that flavor more strongly than an adult does. The most preferred sweet, uh, taste of out of all these is sweet. So no surprise there, we like sugar and we cannot lie. It turns out though that taste is not merely an artifact of the tongue. It requires the interaction of the nose and the tongue. This is known as sensory interaction when one sense affects another sense. So tasting a strawberry, for example, is not just about the flavor on the tongue as the chemicals dissolve, 
but also about how it smelled in the um, nose. And if you want to trick your brain, um, you can hold up a scent to your nose while eating something else, and it will produce a weird sensory interaction, especially if the smells are not complementary and you want to kind of gross yourself out a little bit. Some folks actually have a very special ability to perceive senses in one form triggered by another sense. So let's say they are taking in visual data, but that visual data produces a different kind of sensory interaction. An example might be a person, for example, who sees these twos and fives here. We see twos and fives, no surprise there. Black ink. But a person with a special condition known as synesthesia might experience all the fives as green and the twos as red. So even though there's no color there, an another sensation pops up. This is an involuntary experience. You can't control it. So people, for example, with this condition might say smells have color associations, or letters could have taste associations. But typically, most of the synesthetes that you will encounter, it has to do with colors associated with certain words. Days of the week might have colors, for example. Um, letters might have colors. Numbers might have colors. And so that is more common in terms of what you'll see with, with synesthesia. So this is a very interesting kind of sensory interaction that you can't control as one input into your body is automatically associated with another. Our last sense that we're going to take a look at is hearing. What a world we have when we hear all that is going on around us. Our ears prominently on both sides of our heads to catch sound waves and to channel them on in. How does that work? Is that chemical or is that mechanical? The ear and the ear canal leads to something that looks like a drum, the eardrum or the tympanic membrane. And the way that we hear is through vibrations that make it to that drum. Vibrations all around us, um, sound waves all around us. As my voice is being recorded, it's producing waves at, at frequencies that indicate it's me speaking. Uh, when the eardrum vibrates, it causes tiny little bones in the ear to also vibrate and to maximize those vibrations. These tiny little bones are called ossicles, which is Latin for bonelet or teeny tiny little bone. So ossa means bone in Latin. These ossicles will transmit the vibrations to a snail looking um, organ known as the cochlea. The cochlea is part of your inner ear and that is where the magic happens. The vibrations, the waves that are making it into the inner ear are turned into electrical signals by special little hair, sail, hair sails. Did you hear me? I just went country there. Ooh, my southern showing. Hair cells respond to these vibrations. They're sort of like waving in the um, cochlea and they produce an electrical signal version of that vibration that the brain is able to interpret. Hearing is one of those senses we often take for granted. 
since the 1980s, our ability to put on a pair of headphones with our Sony Walkmans and then, you know, Beats and then our um, earbuds and then finally our AirPods have made it possible for us to carry sound deep in our eardrums on a day-to-day -day basis. We can trick out our cars um, put in some subwoofers and ride through town annoying people, um, making them listen to our music whether they want to or not. This can lead to hearing loss. Um, and thankfully, um, if you have an iPhone, your iPhone in the health app can actually monitor whether or not you were being exposed to too high of a level of sound. How do you sort of measure this? This is done in what's called a decibel. Decibels um, go from very small ranges to up to like 180 on the chart that you can see here. A whisper, if I'm whispering to you, that's about 20 decibels. 20 decibels for a whisper. A normal everyday conversation where I'm just sitting talking with a friend, probably around 60 decibels. Most people with their um, iPhone, their iPod, do we, people have iPods anymore? Um, probably not. iPhone, really. Um, about 100 decibels, but 80 is really, you should probably lower that um, just to be safe. You start experiencing pain around 130, and above 130, you are heading into the range of hearing loss. But let's say you do 100. If you do 100 consistently over years, you are also headed towards hearing loss. You'll probably have um, high frequency hearing loss first um, and then start needing hear hearing aids in your 40s. So here's a warning about protecting your ear health.